Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com and supported by this amazing AI study tool called Visdolia. At the end of this session, I will be providing you with a link for the practice sessions via Visdolia. In continuation with the series on autoimmune diseases, let's learn about Sjogren's syndrome in today's session. So, we will look into the definition, the epidemiology, the etiopathogenesis the morphological features, clinical features and diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. So basically, Sjogren's syndrome is a chronic systemic autoimmune disease which primarily affects the exocrine glands, predominantly involving the lacrimal and the salivary glands, so leading on to dry eyes that is keratoconjunctivitis sicca and dry mouth which is xerostomia. As I told you, that is because of immunologically mediated destruction of lacrimal and salivary glands. It's further divided into two categories. One is primary, another is secondary. Primary is an isolated disorder, whereas secondary is almost always in association with another autoimmune disease, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, which is the most common associated you know, autoimmune disease for secondary Sjogren's syndrome. So, this autoimmune disease is named after Henrik Sjogren, who was a Swedish ophthalmologist, who uh, was the one who first comprehensively described this syndrome way back in 1933 in his doctoral thesis. You know, he reported a group of around 19 women suffering from arthritis, dry eyes, he called it keratoconjunctivitis sicca, and dry mouth. As with any other autoimmune disease, it is common in women usually around 50 to 60 years of age. The peak incidence is in the 50 to 60 years of age group. If you have watched my earlier videos, by now you would have understood that almost all autoimmune diseases is basically because of imbalance between the lymphocyte activation and mechanisms of tolerance. Basically, there is a failure of tolerance which is by genetic factors and environmental triggers. So, coming to the genetic factors in Sjogren syndrome, there is, I mean, it is often said that it has a weak association with some HLA alleles, but then the association in disease causation or manifestations is not really clear. So, environmental triggers include as simple as the viral infection of the salivary glands, which leads to the death of the salivary glandular epithelial cells. And then it releases the tissue antigens, you know, the nuclei is exposed and that is recognized as foreign by our body's immune system. And once it is recognized as foreign, because there is failure of tolerance, that triggers autoantibody production. And this autoantibody production is triggered by the CD4 positive, CD4 positive T cells and B cells specific for these self antigens, which may have escaped the tolerance mechanisms. Let's now understand the pathogenesis of Sjogren's syndrome. We have seen that there is a doubtful HLA association and we all know that there is failure of tolerance. And environmental triggers is basically by means of viral infections where the antigens are exposed, thereby leading on to T and B cell responses. And that T and B cell responses leads to the autoantibody production and immune complex formation, right? So, we should know that around 75% of patients will have antibodies for self-immunoglobulin and that is rheumatoid factor. But then more than that, around 50 to 80% of patients have anti-nuclear antibodies. So, the autoantibodies in Sjogren's syndrome could be either rheumatoid factor or the anti-nuclear antibody usually against these two ribonucleoprotein antigens like SSA, RO antigen and SSBLA. Okay. So, these are the most common anti-nuclear antigens detected in Sjogren's syndrome and these are the serological markers of Sjogren's syndrome. Now, once we know that there is immune complex formation, there is inflammation leading on to tissue damage. At the same time, it is important to note that, you know, we do not know exactly what cytokines or what T-cell subsets are involved in the development of the lesions. So, ultimately, this extensive damage finally leads to fibrosis. But remember, the exact mechanism triggering the autoimmune response, particularly in Sjogren's syndrome, is not fully understood. So, morphologically, the major organs involved are lacrimal and salivary glands. Of course, other glands can also be involved, particularly the glands which are present in the lining of the respiratory and gastrointestinal tract, as well as the vagina. 
So the features include drying of the corneal epithelium, which may be inflamed, eroded, or even ulcerated. It can lead to oral mucosa, which can be atrophied, leading on to inflammatory fissuring and ulceration of the oral mucosa. The disease can also result in dryness and crusting of the nose, leading on to ulcerations and even perforation of the nasal septum. These are some of the morphological findings which you observe in Sjogren's syndrome. Histopathological finding, the earliest finding is periductal, you know, that's the duct, these are the salivary glandular asini, there will be periductal lymphocytic infiltration, okay, it can also be perivascular around the blood vessels. So, the earliest finding is periductal and perivascular lymphocytic infiltration, which eventually leads on to, you know, you know infiltration of extensive infiltrate, sometimes you can even see the germinal centers. Okay. Consequently, the ductal epithelium can be hyperplastic and once it is hyperplastic, it can lead to obstruction as well. So, finally, in the later stages, you know, what happens is there is atrophy of the asini, there can be fibrosis or hyalinization and the parenchyma of the salivary glands or the lacrimal glands can be replaced with the fat. That is the late stage of Sjogren's syndrome when we are looking at the morphology of salivary glands. So, clinically, the most common manifestations is drying of the corneal epithelium, which is keratoconjunctivitis, and this drying leads to blurring of vision, burning, and itching. Okay, there can be accumulations of very thick secretions in the conjunctival sac. Oral mucosa may atrophy, and that is referred to as xerostomia, which leads to difficulty in swallowing solid foods. It leads to decrease in the ability to taste. And the most important uh, morphological manifestation is you can see cracks and fissures in the mouth okay, and the dryness of the buccal mucosa. Enlarged parotid glands you know, is seen in 50% of patients of Sjogren syndrome. Usually, the enlargement is mild to marked enlargement. Almost always bilateral. Both the sides are enlarged. In this case, look at this. That's the enlarged parotid gland. The other symptoms include dryness of nasal mucosa leading on to epistaxis. It can be, if there is pulmonary involvement, there can be recurrent bronchitis and even pneumonitis. The extra glandular disease, I told you, Jogren syndrome predominantly affects the exocrine glands, right? See, the extra glandular involvement is in the form of thinovitis, lung involvement in the form of diffuse pulmonary fibrosis and the neural involvement in the form of peripheral neuropathy. Okay. And these extra glandular disease manifestations are most common in patients who have very high titers of antibodies specific for SSA or Rho. Sometimes they also manifest with you know symptoms of tubulointerstitial nephritis, which manifests in the form of renal tubular acidosis, uricosuria, and phosphaturia. These are the extra glandular disease manifestations. So, how do you diagnose Sjogren's syndrome? Basically, it's by the combination of the patient history, uh, clinical examination, as well as laboratory tests. Sometimes imaging uh, is helpful. And rarely, biopsy is also suggested to find out the histological evidence of Sjogren's syndrome. Serologically, very specific antibodies, you know, such as RO and LA, they are highly indicative of Sjogren's syndrome. Apart from anti-SSA and anti-SSB, there can be other anti-nuclear antibodies as well as rheumatoid factor, which can be elevated, but then they are not specific for Sjogren's because they can be seen in other autoimmune diseases as well. So, remember, when you want to talk about Sjogren's syndrome, it's always about anti-SSA and anti-SSP. Now, what are all the complications you can expect in patients with Sjogren's syndrome? Sometimes, there can be acquisition of somatic mutations, which leads to, you know, clones of B cells gaining an advantage of growth. They have a growth advantage leading on to a lymphoproliferative disorder, particularly marginal zone lymphoma, where 5% of Sjogren's syndrome can develop this kind of complication. Okay? Because it is an autoimmune disease leading on to extensive infiltration of you know, lymphoid cells. Sometimes some of these lymphoid cells you know, acquire somatic mutations leading on to development of marginal zone lymphoma. So, how do you treat? There is absolutely no cure for Sjogren's uh, syndrome. All you can do is only provide symptomatic treatment.
So that's about Sjogren's syndrome. Now that you have completed this topic, I would suggest you to click on the link in the description as well as in the pinned comment below for you to understand this topic much more better by solving these MCQs via Visdolia. This platform not only provides MCQs but also provides you the clinical based scenarios, you know, where you can uh, solve these questions and then try to understand the concepts in much better way. The best part is that you do get instant feedback. It's really fun to learn. So don't forget to click on the link via Visdolia to solve these practice sessions. Thank you for watching. If you have liked the video, hit the like button, do comment, consider subscribing if you have liked this video and do share. Thank you.